Hi, I'm Dr. Finger. Uh, today we're going to have some fun in looking at what makes a diagnosis. Um, currently we have wonderful tools and um, today we'll talk about how we can use those tools to diagnose choroidal tumors. Here we have a tumor and you can see the vascular supply inside. And you can see how it's leaking. And you can even see the leaking going down with gravity towards the bottom of the eye. Tumors do all these things. Each one of these characteristics helps us make the diagnosis. I first presented uh, this lecture as the Robert M. Ellsworth Memorial Lecture at, uh, at Cornell Medical College. All my work, my educational work, is supported by the Eye Cancer Foundation and I have no proprietary interest in any of the technology discussed uh, in this uh, presentation. I'm clinical professor of ophthalmology and uh, director of the ocular tumor services at several of the local hospitals and here at the New York Eye Cancer Center. As I mentioned, we're going to talk about multimodality imaging of choroidal tumors. Let's look back in the day. I've been doing ophthalmic oncology and practicing over 30 years. Back in 1986, if I saw a patient with an intraocular tumor, I could look in with indirect ophthalmoscopy through the dilated pupil. I could do an ultrasound and look at the tumor shape and internal reflectivity with a A scan. I could do an angiogram and take pictures of the inside of the eye, but Unlike today, I'd have to wait three to five days for the Kodachromes to be developed. So I didn't really necessarily have all that information right at my fingertips. Current parameters and our methods, thankfully, are far more complex. We have uh, more direct imaging. We have digital imaging with instant photographs. Uh, we can look at tumors today and compare them to three months ago instantly when the patient walks through the door and has a photograph. Uh, we have some indirect imaging like uh, OCT imaging to look inside the retina or under the retina. We have better ultrasound machines and we have things like physiologic imaging like PET scans and PET CT scans. Uh, we have other forms of physiologic imaging like fundus autofluorescent imaging. Here we have, we look at the tumor with a certain wavelength of light that accentuates lipofuscin, which is a uh, chemical that's given off by dying cells. And you can look at the tumor here, you can see a bit of orange pigment on its surface, but look at the fundus autofluorescent image and you can see dramatically that there's a whole pattern of this chemical, which is one of the diagnostic criteria for distinguishing between a nevus and a choroidal melanoma. We have dynamic ultrasound imaging. Can you see the twinkling inside the tumor? That's blood flow. Sort of like a Doppler, but without the color. And seeing that twinkling helps us distinguish between tumors that have internal vascularity and ones that don't. I'll show you an example of one that doesn't. There's no twinkling there. We have a thing like sludging. As the eye moves, the contents just sludge over. We see that with hemorrhages underneath the retina. But looking at it just as a, a mass, one might think they were also a melanoma. We have this movement too. This is after movement or sh of shifting fluid. Shifting fluid is characteristic of a choroidal melanoma, so it's the detachment associated with a choroidal melanoma, which shifts with gravity. So those were some of the most common tools to evaluate choroidal tumors. Some of the newer tools that we have. So I sat down and tried to figure out what were the most common findings of all these tests that we can currently do for choroidal melanoma. And I came up with this. Oh my. So now we have ophthalmoscopic findings. They're usually pigmented, thickness, fluorescein angiographic findings, fundus autofluorescent imaging findings, ultrasonographic findings. 
OCT findings. We didn't have OCT back in the day. And even radiographic findings, MRI findings, and PET CT findings. So how do, what do we do with 50 findings? Well, sometimes you can simplify them by eliminating the most unique findings and, by, and highlighting them as being most important. So what do we do with this diagnostic complexity? There are over 50 findings on that slide. What we do is we can eliminate the least unique tumor characteristics and highlight the most important characteristics. And if we do that, we have something like this. So from an ophthalmoscopic standpoint, when we look in the eye, if we see subretinal fluid, orange pigment, that lipofuscin, or thickness, those are important. If we document growth, in a way, that's even more important. Uh, on the angiogram, we're looking for a double circulation or an intrinsic circulation within the tumor. And you'll see why that's important, because that's really only documented. Uh, form vessels are only documented in a couple of these tumors and the pattern of circulation inside the tumor helps us differentiate them. The presence of orange pigment is, that is hyper autofluorescent on fundus autofluorescent imaging is really important because orange pigment is really important and allows us to see smaller amounts of orange pigment than we would by just looking in. Thickness is important. Statistically, if a tumor is more than two millimeters thick, it's less likely to be benign. And its shape, its internal reflectivity and shape are all important, but not as important, say, as those three. And OCT is really helpful for looking at subretinal fluid, which again goes back to those three most important findings. So looking at those three most important findings, I put together a mnemonic device to help us remember and differentiate the smaller tumors from melanomas, smaller nevi, suspicious nevi from melanomas. And most people would agree that if you see orange pigment, best seen on fundus autofluorescent imaging, if you see subretinal fluid, best seen on OCT, and if you have a thickness of two or more millimeters, best measured with ultrasound, you have a melanoma. And here's a small melanoma with all those findings. Maybe not so easy to see just looking at the tumor, but you have the orange pigment. Thickness in 2D is tough to see, but in ophthalmoscopy you can definitely see it's thick. And then there's some hint of fluid coming down, but here on this image you can also see on fundus autofluorescent imaging that there is dependent fluid and this retina has become diseased and therefore is accumulating that same orange pigment. Ultrasound has been and continues to be a very important tool for looking at intraocular tumors. Here we have a mushroom-shaped choroidal melanoma. We all know that most tumors in the eye, if they form a mushroom shape, are melanomas. There are some pseudomelanomas that can form mushroom shapes, but they're unusual. You can see the retinal detachment also on the ultrasound, and you can see the internal reflectivity on this A scan. So A scan is like a pencil of sound that runs through the tumor, and you can see that 45 degree angle as the reflectivity goes down at that rate, and that is very classic for a choroidal melanoma. These are pictures of two years later after the tumor was plaqued and, and, and sterilized by radiation. And you can see the tumor is reduced to a little nubbin. But interestingly enough, it still has low internal reflectivity on the ACE game. So let's do a tough case. That was a very straightforward garden variety type case. So here we have uh, a, a 50 year old lady who came in with this variable pigmentation around the disc and some fluid down below and uh, this is the clinical picture and most people would agree this is not very impressive uh, in itself or diagnostic in itself. But on the OCT, especially this EDI OCT2 that we have from Heidelberg, uh, we have the tumor beneath the retina 
we can see the subretinal fluid best with OCT, and you can even see the photoreceptors are degenerating uh, around, above the tumor. On uh, three-dimensional reconstruction of the OCT, which is very helpful, uh, also called rasterized uh, image, uh, we can see the subretinal fluid beneath the retina and also the dysmorphic photoreceptors and the tumor beneath that. So we have this tumor with subretinal fluid. On fundus autofluorescent imaging, and remember that was the best way to see lipofuscin, we can see definite hyper autofluorescence around the disc. We can also actually see the subretinal fluid, which may be quite fresh because there's not a lot of orange pigment in it. So this tumor has thickness, orange pigment, and subretinal fluid. With thickness of two or more millimeters, that's a melanoma. So let's look at circulation patterns. Fluorescein angiography is quite helpful. This is a different tumor. This tumor covers the nerve, and you can actually see on the color photograph, you don't even need an angiogram. You can see the tumor's blood vessels underneath the retina. Of the four most common choroidal tumors, uh, melanoma and osteoma are two that where you can actually see blood vessels on, beneath the retina on the tumor. But when you do an angiogram, it jumps out at you. You can definitely see the intratumoral blood vessels and you have to catch them early because they leak. And so I suggest you make sure you get early frames. You can also see small aneurysms coming off of those vessels. But typically melanomas are slow growing. This particular tumor that we just saw grew this much in a month. And as I, sa as I said, growth is perhaps the most important finding in diagnosing a melanoma. Also, that mushroom shape that I talked about, it comes in different sizes and distributions. This is a more classic mushroom. This is a mushroom that's tilted over. This is a really tiny mushroom. And here's another mushroom. So it doesn't have to be just that classic sh shape that we saw in the first ultrasound. In fact, on this OCT, you can see a mini mushroom coming out of the tumor that might not be seen clinically. So the mnemonic I suggest for you to, to distinguish melanomas from suspicious nevi is most. There's another mnemonic, uh, Tsvam UHHD, which is very complicated and encompasses all, a lot of the different findings that we have with uh, choroidal melanomas. But it's complicated and difficult to get your hands around and remember. So I suggest that you remember most. Also remember that the dome shape is much more common than the mushroom shape. So not all melanomas are mushroom shaped. In fact, in the collaborative ocular melanoma study, only 25% were um, mushroom shaped. So in summary, most beans, orange pigment, best seen on fundus autofluorescent imaging, subretinal fluid, best seen on OCT, or most reliably seen on OCT, and thickness of more than two millimeters by ultrasound. It's simple. So let's segue a little bit to the most common choroidal malignancy though it's not primary, the most common choroidal malignancy is choroidal metastasis. And I went through the same exercise, and I looked at all the findings I could think of ophthalmoscopically, fluorescein angiographically, fundus autofluorescent imaging, ultrasound, OCT, and radiographically. And what did I come away with? Well, if you look in, most of them are fairly lightly colored. They tend to have overlying retinal pigment epithelial spicule, RPE spicules. They tend to be faster growing than melanomas, which is very important, because sometimes you'll have a suspicious nevus, and you'll say, come back in eight to 10 or 12 weeks, which can be a long time for a patient with a choroidal metastasis. Tumor could get quite large over that period of time. Uh, they tend to have a lot more little microaneurysms than a melanoma. I know it's a sort of a subtle finding, but it can be important. 
and they tend to have a different, slightly different pattern of fundus autofluorescent imaging. Uh, they, since they grow quickly, they're consuming the retinal pigment epithelium, and those little islands of pigment are often residual RPE that have a lot of lipofuscin in them, so they light up quite dramatically. In terms of ultrasound, the internal reflectivity of a metastasis is like the primary. And as we know, most metastases come from either lung or breast, so they're fibrous. So when the ultrasound goes through them, they hit little fibrous elements and they are spiky. So they have variable internal reflectivity. Uh, they tend not to have the twinkling that we saw of a melanoma because those blood vessels in a metastasis that are growing quite quickly haven't had as much time to form. And so they're more leaky and less uh, able to be, uh, less, they're smaller and uh, less able to be observed. Um, in terms of OCT, uh, unlike a melanoma that tends to be more dome-shaped, a uh, metastasis tends to be more irregularly shaped. And so that helps us also with the diagnosis. As you see, there's a number of other findings, but those are really the clinical findings that you can use in your office to help dif differentiate a metastasis, say, from a melanoma. Also, PET-CT, as you will see in the next slides, can be quite important. So I tried to think of a mnemonic for metastasis, and I came up with GRIM. That probably suits uh, the process. Uh, growth, as I said, much more rapid growth than a choroidal melanoma, best documented by photography. So you get a photograph when the patient comes in, get another photograph when a patient comes in the second time. If you are observing a small lesion and you think it might be a metastasis, you may observe the patient at first. Uh, the RPE spicules are fundus autofluorescent positive, and you can see examples of the little pigmented spots on top which will light up with the fundus autofluorescent images. The irregular surface that you can see on the OCT or the ultrasound. And microaneurysms, lots of little dots are very common with meta metastatic choroidal tumors and less, they exist on choroidal melanomas but in much less uh, numbers. They also tend to be lightly colored and poorly defined, which is more, again, a more sub a subjective finding. So here we have an example of the tumor growing, consuming the RPE and causing these islands that light up with fundus autofluorescent imaging, just like a metastasis, because that's what it is. And you can see on the OCT this wavy surface with subretinal fluid. On the angiogram, we see lots of little dot-like microaneurysms associated with the metastasis. Here's another, another metastasis. Here we have again the wavy surface subretinal fluid. Again, the um, photoreceptors are dysmorphic uh, because the tumor is giving off, most likely giving off toxic substance or consuming them, and the subretinal fluid, and the microaneurysms that we discussed. There was uh, one of my fellows, Dr. Natesh, looked at these particular islands of dying RPE and they found that they lit up. So you can see the pattern, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, which shows that the, as they evolve, they are, are hyper autofluorescent and full, full of uh, lipofuscin. Lipofuscin is found in many places, uh, not just in choroidal melanomas. Um, you have lipofuscin deposition, say, after a heart attack in your uh, heart muscle. And uh, there is lipofuscin in your skin when you get age spots. Here's another uh, example of watching a small metastasis. Here we have a rather uh, atypical uh, tumor, but really not, doesn't uh, strike you as being uh, necessarily a metastasis. And within several weeks, the tumor has expanded and the pattern of fundus autofluorescent imaging and consuming of the uh, retinal pigment epithelium uh, has progressed. You can see the RPE year is still somewhat intact, and by the time the month went by, this whole thing is dark and uh, has been already uh, destroyed. This is a PET CT. A lot of times patients want to know what it looks like. People are claustrophobic, I can identify. Um, 
this is a fairly open type of uh, scanner uh, and it's extremely valuable. It allows us to find the primary. Oftentimes a patient comes to the ophthalmic oncologist or the retinologist and they have a metastatic lesion with no known primary. One way to make sure, most of them, as I said, were uh, lung or breast, but we have metastasis from thyroid, from kidney, from prostate, from many organs all over the body. So one way to do a census of the entire body looking for a primary site is to order a PET-CT. And there's an article where we describe this that was published in the AJO. Um, my student, Dr. Patel, was primary author. You can see here's the chest and the, and the primary tumor here and here on the CAT scan. Difference of the CAT scan, you can see the density, but here on the PET-CT, you can see it lighting up because it's, it's absorbing radioactive glucose because it's metabolically active. So it per puts form and function on the same page, and that's what makes PET-CT invaluable. The other thing that we noticed was that the metastatic lesions lit up too inside the eye. Uh, this is uh, a, a slide from a picture from a large choroidal melanoma by Dr. Reddy. It's a paper by Dr. Reddy looking just at the intensity of the PET uh, brightness inside the eye using PET or PET-CT. And we looked at the same thing in this paper of the met metastasis and an interesting finding came out and that was that the metastasis for size was much brighter than the choroidal melanomas of uh, similar sizes. And so that is also another uh, aspect that we could consider when trying to differentiate the two. What about this tumor? I like to throw in a couple of interesting cases like the small melanoma. Here we have a blonde tumor, poor margins, no pigment on the surface, maybe a few little microaneurysms, but nothing to write home about. This patient had the same thing. It's a blonde tumor, variably pigmented, even had an eyelid lesion. So we did a PET-CT on those patients. And what did we find? They had sarcoidosis. So sometimes even a uh, diagnosis of a benign condition can um, be helpful in differentiating a metastatic lesion uh, from something else. This work was published by Dr. Uh, Shulman uh, and myself. So in terms of metastasis, the mnemonic would be GRIM. Growth, best seen by comparative photography. RPE spicules, best seen by fundus autofluorescent imaging. Irregular surface, best seen by OCT or ultrasound if it's large enough. And microaneurysms, best seen on fluorescein angiography. The light color and poorly defined margins are also helpful. So let's uh, move on to choroidal hemangiomas, another relatively common choroidal tumor. So I did the same thing. I sat down and wrote down all the ophthalmoscopic findings, uh, fluorescein findings, autofluorescent findings, and then I picked out the ones that were more, most unique and the most diagnostic. So in terms of looking in, hemangiomas tend to be red or orange. Not all of them, but most of them are. They uh, tend not to grow. Um, I can't remember one tumor that, or mangioma that I saw grow significantly uh, over a six month period of time. Uh, on the other hand, oftentimes the patient will come in with a history of hemangioma, uh, which is quite helpful in differentiating it from anything else. Uh, it has a very unique fluorescein pattern, which is really quite helpful, uh, called a coarse vascular pattern. And it can have a few microaneurysms like we saw with melanomas and metastatic disease, but nothing like uh, those two. Uh, ultrasound findings are also very uh, consistently different. Uh, they tend to have very high internal reflectivity, and I'm going to explain why. And OCT in, in this case uh, can show things like cystic changes and subretinal fluid, but uh, 
they're interesting and they are findings that you see with choroidal hemangiomas, but not necessarily helpful in differentiating them from other tumors. Also, this happens to be another thing was treatment for, for uh, hemangiomas in some centers is uh, photodynamic therapy. And photodynamic therapy will work very well for hemangiomas, whereas it won't work so well for melanoma uh, or a metastatic lesion or as well. And so uh, that is a way indirectly of figuring out what it is, a diagnosis by treatment. Now, hopefully we won't get there. We'll figure out what it is first. So uh, the circumscribed choroidal hemangioma, this is several cases, this reddish tumor this next to the disc here, or this orange tumor that's temporal to the macula or inferior to the macula or supratemporal to the macula. All of these are hemangiomas. They tend to be reddish, uh, have a moderately high internal reflectivity and a coarse vascular pattern on angiography. So this is an A scan or a pencil of sound going through the tumor. The sound goes through the vitreous, hits the tumor, high reflectivity, and then the sclera before going into the orbit. Remember the melanoma was low reflective and the metastatic lesion was variably reflected because it had those fibrous elements like breast and, and lung. And so the hemangioma has very high internal reflectivity. And the way I like to remember it is that this is a blood vessel tumor, and these are very formed blood vessels. So there's a lot of echogenic uh, spaces and differences within the tumor. Each time the sound hits one of those differences, it reflects more sound back and causes a higher spike. So it's a very uh, reflective tumor. Here's a B scan of hemangioma, and if you don't have an A scan or you don't know how to use an A scan, you can just look at the tumor and you can see that it's bright compared to, say, uh, the choroid or definitely the vitreous. If you look at hemangiomas and compare them to melanomas, melanomas tend to be more moderate or low reflective. You can see, if you have color in your uh, ultrasound machine, you can colorize the photo and that accentuates the differences and the high internal reflectivity. So here's a fluorescein. So here we have our hemangioma, the reddish tumor. You can almost see that there are vascular spaces in there, but when you start the angiogram, you can definitely see this coarse vascular pattern. If you remember, the, the melanoma had almost tube-like blood vessels and the metastatic lesion just sort of leaked had very poorly formed vessels, but the hemangioma has jagged and well-formed vessels. You have to catch it early again. If you wait too long in the angiogram, it's just going to fill, and you won't see the jagged edges or the coarse vascular filling associated with hemangioma. This is the late pattern. This doesn't help anybody. It's just leaking, and so it's very hard to see the coarse vascular pattern if you wait to the late phases of the angiogram. Here's a tougher case. So here we have, it is reddish, but you don't really see any of the structures inside the lesion. And we do the angiogram and we see again the coarse vascular pattern. So that's helping us make the diagnosis. Later phase of the angiogram, you do see a few scattered microaneurysms but it's nothing like the melanoma or especially nothing like the metastatic tumor. On the OCT, now this is quite interesting. You'll see the subretinal fluid, as you see on OCT, and OCT is one of the most sensitive methods for finding subretinal fluid. But remember, both with melanoma and the metastatic lesion, you had dysmorphic photoreceptors. But in this tumor, which is not giving off the same uh, toxins and making the same changes in the overlying tissues, the photoreceptors look relatively intact. Here's a fundus autofluorescent image showing some modeled hyperautofluorescence and, you know, associated with this uh, hemangioma. So you can have hyperautofluorescence with hemangiomas, but typically when they are leaking or doing something active. The B scan showed the high internal reflectivity 
for review. Better seen with, with uh, colorized images. So in review of critical characteristics of choroidal hemangioma, we have the high internal reflectivity, best seen on ultrasound. We have the reddish color, best seen by photographs or by looking in with ophthalmoscopy. And that coarse vascular pattern, best seen by fluorescein angiography. I'm trying to think of a mnemonic, it would be HRC, but that's a little passe right now. The next tumor I'd like to talk about is choroidal hemorrhage. And choroidal hemorrhages can be difficult um, because they can look pigmented. And sometimes uh, people have even done surgery on them for melanomas, uh, thinking that they were melanomas. So we have to be very careful and look at these characteristics critically to try to separate out the choroidal hemorrhage from the melanoma. So when you look in, the hemorrhage tends to be more black or white or even red. Red like blood, white like dehemoglobinized blood, and black like old blood. So if you see these things, they can be seen with a melanoma, but they're very unlikely and you almost never see them with a metastasis. Look at the edges. The edges are very telling. If you see a little blood around the edge, it could mean quite a bit. If you look at the surface of the tumor, you'll see folds. Sometimes they're so remarkable that they look like corrugated cardboard. And look for synchronous age-related macular degeneration. Um, if you're looking at an, a tumor that's in the peripheral part of the retina and it's an older patient and they have exudated macular degeneration as well, that should be put in the calculation when you're making the diagnosis. The other thing about bleeding is it changes. Just like a bruise that you may have on your arm, uh, it will change ra rather quickly. So observation can be very important in uh, diagnosing a choroidal hemorrhage. Uh, they tend to get smaller over time, unlike melanomas and metastasis. So sometimes you can, if you have a high index of suspicion that you're looking at a, a uh, hemorrhage, then you can see the patient back in three to four weeks, as long as it's not sight threatening. And if you notice that the tumor is getting smaller, then you have that extra uh, bit of information that may be helpful in making that diagnosis. Uh, in terms of fluorescein, that you can see a, a blackout. Bleeding in front of the choroid makes it go black. And so that's a very unusual and very pathognomonic finding. This early blackout and late blackout, it just blacks out through the entire phase of the study. And other things include a sharp scleral demarcation, which I'll show you. Uh, sometimes you'll see blood stuck to the inner retina, which you never see with, or almost never see with other tumors and that corrugated surface. There is a lot of literature on doing MRIs on uh, eccentric discoforms and choroidal hemorrhages. Uh, they also change over time. So unless you're gonna be committed to doing serial MRIs, I don't find them that helpful. So here's my mnemonic for uh, choroidal hemorrhage, Bach. Do a little classical music mnemonic. Uh, it blocks fluorescence. There's after movement, which we'll see on the ultrasound. They change relatively rapidly over time. And look at the edges for hemorrhage. So here's a choroidal hemorrhage. You can see the white dehemoglobinized blood, the black blood, and the hemorrhage along its edge. That's a pretty easy one. Look at the angiogram. There's a total blackout there that's consistent with a choroidal hemorrhage. This was a 16-year-old boy who came in with this little tiny, tiny choroidal hemorrhage. But sure enough, there was blackout in the phase, which mostly blackout even in the late phases at five minutes. Couldn't do an ultrasound. What do we do? What's well, a small lesion? Did not appear to be lighting up or causing uh, uh, any uh, immediately sight-threatening problems. So we watch him very closely for change. Here's the other end of the spectrum. This is a giant choroidal hemorrhage circling the optic nerve. Again, blackout on fluorescein angiography, early and late. So let's look at after movement. After mo movement is a very uh, specific finding on ultrasound. Here, when you move the eye, 
the content sludge. There's no twinkling, like the vascular pattern with the melanoma. There's just this after movement of material that's underneath the retina that's, that can't stop until it comes to rest. On the OCT, we see a very irregular surface, almost corrugated. And the other finding, which I find really helpful, is right at the edge of the lesion, you will often see an abrupt, almost 90 degree elevation. Uh, the choroidal tumors infiltrate the choroid and lift up the retina in a more, uh, in a less dramatic fashion. So you'll, you won't see this 90 degree or in this case, 75 or 80 degree elevation at the edge, uh, that, like you will. Here's another one. Look at this 90 degree elevation at the edge, uh, characteristic of a choroidal hemorrhage. This is uh, a uh, higher magnification image of the same. You look at the choroid here, it looks normal. There's no tumor in it. And then all of a sudden, boom, you hit the tumor and you're up. And the tumor is not from the choroid necessarily or it could be way down yonder, but at least here it's subretinal material, which in this case is blood. This is uh, the best picture of the corrugated surface. You can see the little red ridges on the surface of the choroidal hemorrhage. This is the color picture. The angiogram is more dramatic. And on the OCT, you can see this corrugated surface. I expect that the Bleeding happened, it lifted up the retina, and as it reabsorbs, it's coming down, and everything was stretched, and now it is rippled. On ultrasound, they tend to be lower reflective, like fluid, because blood is close to fluid. So ultrasonography is actually a great way to, along with observation, of monitoring how the, the tumor changes over time. And there are select ultrasound characteristics that also can be helpful. And I thought I'd make a little display of these. Uh, one is that the tumor sclera interface is very sharp. And you can see that with, with a number of tumors, but you reproducibly see that with choroidal hemorrhages. Here we have vitreous blood. Also a tip off that there was bleeding. And you can see again that sharp transition between the tumor and the sclera here. Here we have a serous component. This is completely echolucent. Um, and here we have uh, the tumor itself within a regular surface. So Bach blocks fluorescein after movement that we can best see on ultrasound imaging. Uh, change, relatively rapid change over time, and the hemorrhage at its edges. So the last tumor that we're going to talk about is choroidal osteoma. And oftentimes patients are quite surprised that they can actually develop bone inside their eye. But that's what it is. It's a piece of bone underneath the retina. Uh, they tend to be yellow. They have scalloped edges, unlike the other tumors. Uh, they tend to be relatively flat. They're often next to the optic nerve. Uh, they are, on fluorescein, they can develop new blood vessels at, primarily at the edges. There are very specific fluorescein findings where that piece of bone has trouble absorbing the fluorescein that's injected in the vein, it goes through the body and goes to the osteoma, and it's a piece of bone, so it doesn't absorb the fluorescein very well. But once it's in there, the fluorescein really can't get out either. So it has intense late staining that persists, which I'll show you. Ultrasound is fairly pathognomonic for choroidal osteoma because it's a bone. It's very dense and the acoustics, acoustic impedance is very high. So let's see some pictures of osteomas. Here we have our scalloped edges. You can have some pigment on the surface near the optic nerve. And there must be a good one where I can show you tumor vessels. Here's one. That's the best one of a tumor vessel. Like, remember I said, the formed vessels are primarily seen with choroidal melanomas. 
and osteomas. Well, here we have form vessels inside the bone. Sometimes they're a little more subtle, but again, you see the scalloped edges. And they're relatively flat. On ultrasound, though, it's a very dramatic picture. The bone will block all the ultrasound coming across the eye and create a, a shadow into the orbit. The other tumor that does that is retinoblastoma, which isn't in this lecture. Again, blood vessels. In, look at this intrinsic vessel at the arrow. Pigment, juxtapapillary, scalloped edges, high internal reflectivity on ultrasound. Here's our angiogram. The angiogram is filling. The has slow early filling because it's bone and it's hard for the fluorescein to get in and intense late staining. So on fluorescein angi angiography, because it's bone, it's very hard for the fluorescein to get into the tumor. So it, it's late to stain. But then over long periods of time, there is intense late staining. You see everything else is washed out. The fluorescein is washed out of all the blood vessels and the choroid and the tumor is still, still bright. Um, one of my fellows, Dr. Leon Freitan, did a study of spectral domain OCT imaging of choroidal osteoma. You can see here a couple examples of osteoma. One of the things that I want you to see is that the overlying choroid is compressed and that there is a tumor coming beneath in the deep choroid or sclera that's coming up. Uh, they can be peaked, they can have subretinal fluid, uh, but uh, when they are peaked, they are atypical compared to, say, a melanoma or a metastatic lesion. Um, you can see they can even have low reflectivity, so they're relatively uh, light loosened on OCT, and it's likely that these are more immature lesions. And again, on the ultrasound, there's shadowing of the orbit that helps us uh, define the diagnosis in this case. This was really fascinating. Uh, what uh, Dr. Freitan did was he got hold of a picture of uh, histopathology of choroidal osteoma from uh, Donald Gass's work and compared it to what we saw on the OCT. And here you can see the lacunae within the bone on the pathology and you can see the lacunae within the bone uh, beneath the retina. And that is another finding that's helpful to distinguish uh, osteomas from other tumors. So uh, critical characteristics include that they're yellow, scalloped edges, high internal reflectivity, late intense hyperfluorescence on fluorescein angiography. If you have any questions, give us a call uh, or visit eyecancer.com where there's a full uh, online text and atlas available for your comparison. I want to take a moment to thank you for your attention and to thank the Eye Cancer Foundation who supported much of the research presented in this lecture and for their committed support for international multicenter cooperation in ophthalmic oncology. Thank you and have a nice day.